Hello, everyone. I'm delighted to see a great turnout for my presentation today. I am very passionate about my work, passionate about the environment, and I hope at the end of today's uh, presentation, I will have motivated at least one of you to become an environmental scientist, maybe many more. Today I'm going to tell you about what I've spent the last 28 years of my professional career looking at, and that is mercury contamination of the environment. I was very fortunate uh, that as I was completing my graduate studies at the University of Wisconsin, some unintentional data, that is, people that were looking for another problem, uh, inadvertently discovered there was high levels of mercury in fish in some of the most remote locations of northern Wisconsin. And, of course, I was looking for a job. And when I asked if I wanted to join up with the USGS to look at this problem regarding high levels of mercury in fish in otherwise pristine lakes, I pondered and thought, well, what's mercury doing there in the first place? And paused again and thought, that sounds like fun. Sounds like a bit of detective work. Little did I know it would take us to get to where we are now. And that is a very positive outcome that I'm happy to say, I think we're already seeing improving conditions. And in the next uh, 10, 15 years or so, I think we'll even see much more improved conditions. So just a bit of an introduction. I work at the US Geological Survey. The particular I office I work at is in this slide. Uh, I'm located on the west side of Madison. Uh, I work in what's called a water resources office. And that's because most of the questions that we look at have to deal with water contamination issues or water supply issues. However, while I'm located in Wisconsin, our work is literally conducted all over the world. So mercury, a lot of people don't necessarily uh, know that much about this problem. And no, we're not talking about the mercury planet. Uh, we're instead talking about element number 80, which is in the red circle here. Uh, element mercury, number 80 on the periodic table, has two rather um, distinguishing characteristics. The first one is, is that in addition to bromine, the one in the blue circle there, um, it's the only two elements on the periodic table that at standard room temperature and pressure are found in the liquid state. That's why many of you, when you think about mercury, you think about the silvery metallic metal. And that's, in fact, true. That's the form of mercury we most commonly see uh, when we see mercury at room temperature. Um, the other distinguishing characteristic that it has, even from bromine, however, is that it's one of the very, very few elements that has no known uh, necessary value for any living system. In other words, your body, or not the body of any fish or wildlife, or even a microbe, has any known use for mercury. And in fact, any mercury is toxic at some level. And so that's why it's such a concern, is that uh, while it's a member of the periodic table, and in specific locations around the Earth, it is found in great amounts, but those are in very small locations, uh, it can be a very toxic problem. The history of mercury is actually quite interesting. Um, the, no, the recognition of mercury goes all the way back to Greek mythology. When the uh, Greeks uh, had their god named Mercury, and it was the, the messenger god, as 
many of you know, and it gets its name aptly from how quickly it will roll down, uh, you know, a tabletop or quickly disperse if you take liquid mercury and drop it. I don't encourage you to do that. Um, that's the kind of thing that years ago, before we knew about mercury's toxicity, including when I was a child, uh, each one of us in science class got a little bit of mercury to play with in our hands. And many of us uh, curious uh, members of the class, of course, we dropped it on the floor. And it would quickly just disperse into a bunch of small beads. And if you've ever seen uh, the, mer uh, the movie Terminator, you, you know what I'm talking about, how the mercury beads just completely uh, disperse across. But if you start gathering them up, they'll all start to coagulate again into a larger bead. Um, one of the other interesting historical aspects about mercury is the Romans uh, figured out many useful aspects of mercury. And one of those, and that spilled all the way to modern times, including one of the most problematic uses of mercury today, and that is it forms an amalgam with gold and silver, precious metals. And what does that amalgam mean? Well, just like if you took a teaspoon of salt and put it into water in a, in a dish, it dissolves. Well, mercury does the very same thing to gold. If I took the ring on my finger, there we are, and put it into a beaker of mercury, it would in fact dissolve. And so what the Romans figured out is that they could use liquid mercury, which was plentiful around the areas of the Roman Empire. Some of the largest deposits of, of mercury exist in the former strongholds of the Roman Empire. And they figured out that they could take mercury and put ore, you know, that contained little specks of gold and put though that ore into uh, beds of mercury and extract the gold. And in fact, that's how they made uh, all those beautifully or ornamented uh, gold leaf buildings during the Roman era. That's how they acquired so much gold. Um, so that top picture on the right called cinnabar, that's the beautiful ore of mercury, one of the most beautiful minerals on earth, a gorgeous, very bright red color. And that's, you know, a lot of times the pictures of of minerals are, are greatly exaggerated in how you actually see them. But in fact, cinnabar is that beautiful color. Um, and so if you took uh, mercury from that cinnabar, what you do is you roast it. You heat up that block of, of ore and it makes elemental mercury. And so the Romans figured that out and that's what the, the Roman there holding the, the pot is. Uh, as they heat it up just vats of ores of mercury and in the bottom of the pot after roasting it, they were left with liquid mercury in the bottom of the pot. Um, well, as more and more people learn that mercury has very special properties and could be used to your advantage to get things like gold and silver, more and more people began to use it. And uh, the acceleration in the use of mercury has resulted in the condition we have today. And so the left-hand side of this diagram shows, you know, the amount of mercury before man started utilizing mercury. These are based on estimates of looking at, you know, old sediments back, way back into time, into pre-man's development. And you can just compare any one of the boxes or arrows on the two sides of the diagram, and you can see that there's about a three, four, or five-fold increase in the amount of mercury or the amount of mercury moving in the case of the arrows that um, uh, used to be uh, on the surface of the planet and now has been redistributed. But let me make a, an important clarification. We haven't created any mercury. All mankind has done is to take where mercury was very uh, specifically located in, in, in just a very few locations on Earth. And there aren't many places where mercury is in high abundance. Uh, but where it was in high abundance, man has sought to use that mercury and redistribute it. Uh, originally by making use of mercury ore for its purposes of extracting metals, and more recently as the diagram 
on the right shows uh, the power plant that we drew a circle around. And that's primarily from two sources nowadays, and that is production of electricity by burning coal, which I'll talk a lot about today. And the other one is an issue that we've largely dealt with back in 1990, and that was when we used to burn a lot of our waste instead of putting it into landfills, uh, that waste that we were burning as recently as 1990 contained a lot of mercury. Since that time, uh, there's been strict regulations put in place on what you can actually burn, and also getting mercury out of a lot of the products that many people today buy and use, and, and the, the residual of, of those products uh, used to be burned, and now those products don't contain nearly as much mercury. So we've been able to deal with that very effectively. Um, a lot of people don't know that were it not for the co-location of mercury very nearby where all the gold deposits were in California, there never would have been a thing called the California gold rush. But in fact, mother nature uh, largely uh, conspired to work against us, and we still have that legacy today. So if you're from California, or you know California ge geology and geography well, the mountain range that's closest to the ocean, the Pacific Ocean front, is called the Cascade Range. And by mere coincidence, that is North America's and one of the world's most enriched areas in mercury. And across the Central Valley, only a couple hundred miles to the east, are the beautiful Sierra Mountains, the Sierra Nevadas. And that, in fact, is one of the world's most rich deposits in gold. So it didn't take people very long to figure out that there was a mercury-rich area very nearby to a gold-rich area. So they began the California Gold Rush using the very same technology that the Romans did years ago by extracting mercury and then putting gold ore into it and making uh, so-called sluice boxes. So here's a group of four miners from back in the 1850s. In the bottom of that sluice box is a bed of mercury and they're just letting water that's carrying uh, sludge of the ore across it, and as that sludge moves across it, the heavy gold particles settle into the mercury, and that mercury uh, bed on the bottom of that sluice box then traps the gold into that mercury, and at the end of the day, the miners would take that mercury out of the sluice box, put it over a hot pot, and evaporate the mercury away, and in the bottom of your bucket is at a gold nugget. So that's the way it worked. And a lot of people got very rich, and so a lot of people rushed to the west coast of, of the United States to uh, join in in the riches. But I can tell you today that now, 165 years later, we're still dealing with the uh, outcome of the California Gold Rush, because unlike many of the other contaminants that we're all worried about today, like PCBs and dioxins and furons and PBDDs, all those other contaminants are man-synthesized and eventually Mother Nature will deal with by degrading them. Because mercury is an element, Mother Nature will not, in fact, degrade it like those other contaminants. So legacy activities like the California Gold Rush will have an impact for millennia moving forward. And in fact, the areas downstream of these impacted areas from the gold rush are some of the most intensively researched areas today regarding legacy mercury contamination. Documenting what's happened with mercury use uh, has been done many ways. Um, this happens to be a, a, a key figure from a, a study that I did about uh, 15 years ago. And what we did was to go to a glacier in Wyoming and the glacier had ice that was about 300 meters deep. And that ice uh, accumulates on the glacier at a rate of about one meter per year. So if you take a core from the top all the way down to the bottom of that glacier, you're essentially probing into the past. 
and looking at things that can be recorded in ice. But one of the things uh, about mercury in the, in, in the atmosphere is that either snow or rain scavenges the mercury from the sky, scavenges the mercury from the sky, and it falls to the earth. So in the case of this glacier, uh, the snow accumulating on top of the glacier every winter uh, would get recorded in this record that's shown on the plot. So as you can see, the x-axis on the bottom is total mercury concentration, and the y-axis is the age of the ice. And what we can do is date the ice. We can infer the age of it by certain chemical markers that are, are known to have been caused by certain events in history. Things like volcanic eruptions, like Tamboa and Krakatoa, very distant on the other side of the Earth's uh, eruptions, or nearby ones like Mount St. Helens at the top of that profile. But what, what's very interesting is that we can see known notes, uh, known events, sorry, in history. So things like the gold rush, uh, right in the middle of the profile. Uh, and there was, in fact, a bimodal uh, distribution to the activity of the gold rush. It started in about 1850, slowed down after about 15 years, came back very strong. And then there was this legal uh, determination that happened that's called the Sawyer decision that, based on environmental impact grounds, ended the gold rush. And so very quickly, the gold rush came to an end, and so did the appearance of mercury in the atmosphere uh, above glacier in Wyoming. But we can also see other key events, like we can see manufacturing to support World War II. There's a lot of metal and mercury used in those bombs and airplanes and everything else we use to arm ourselves for World War II. But the big event, the big pink area at the top of the profile, is really what most of us are looking at today, who are mercury researchers, and that is just the general overall use of mercury that's been released to the environment from overall industrial activity. A very key feature, though, is at the very, very top. And you can see the sharp decline at the top of this profile. When we published this paper around 1992, uh, we weren't sure what if it was really coming down or not. But now, after several more years have, have ticked off, we're confident that, in fact, what we saw in this ice core is, in fact, what is happening today. And that is, we are doing better. We are cleaning up our uses and emissions to mercury to the environment. And I have uh, many more slides about that. Um, so here's a picture of what most of us did who are my age. I'm 56 years old. Uh, but back when I was in grade school in science class, we were each given a little bead of mercury to play with literally in class. At that time, it was no fault of my teacher or anybody else. We didn't know that mercury was that toxic. Um, that had not been revealed to the world yet. And so my little bead of mercury I played with, I put on the floor, we pushed it across the floor. And uh, thankfully, that's not done any longer. Um, because mercury does have very serious health effects. Um, one thing you should know, however, before I proceed any further, is that the most impactful in terms of human health and wildlife health uh, form of mercury is not this liquid elemental mercury, but a much more dangerous form called methyl mercury. And I'll talk a lot today about methyl mercury, but all of the uh, health effects to humans and the same health effects play out onto wildlife. Um, are mostly driven by the methylated form of mercury. Um, so the elemental mercury that I had in my hand that day didn't necessarily uh, invoke any of these, these uh, health impacts that are on the slide, but those um, known impacts to the slide include the deterioration of our nervous system, impairments to hearing and speech and vision, uh, involuntary muscle movements, uh, uh, inability to chew or swallow, and overall just um, uh, ability, uh, our, our ability to process thought. And that one's not even on this slide. This picture is a little bit dated, but that's a very well-known one now, that it affects our 
our brain. And that's the one that we're most uh, concerned about these days. Um, it's very interesting, again, uh, going back in history to know that uh, if you ever read the, read the book, Alice in Wonderland, you'll, you, a key figure in that book is called the Mad Hatters. And the Mad Hatters, in fact, were mad, crazy. And it was because these were a group of people who worked in the hat industry. By that, I mean making hats. And one of the ways, one of the processes that they did when making felt hats was to clean them up using liquid mercury. So unknowingly, these people working in factories, working in enclosed spaces and with large volumes of, of liquid mercury right there at their desk, were getting exposed to every day uh, very high levels of mercury, mostly probably through inhalation. Because that's something about liquid mercury that, again, it's hard to see. Our eyes can't see it. But just like water evaporates from a glass on your, on your desk, mercury is evaporating from a beaker or from the hand in the picture above. Our eyes just can't see the wavelength that would demonstrate that mercury. But if you, in fact, shined a light uh, at a much shorter wavelength than we can see, at about 254 nanometers, you would see the vapors of mercury evaporating uh, from a, a liquid pool of mercury. And lastly, and it's the most tragic event, and it's the event that caused alarms to be set off all across the world uh, regarding mercury toxicity. It happened in a small fishing village on the very southern tip of Japan called Minamata, Japan. It's the most well-documented and unfortunate incident with mercury poisoning across in, 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 in man's history. Um, and that was a very unfortunate direct release of the toxic form of mercury. Again, we call it methyl mercury. Uh, we did not know about the toxic perils of methyl mercury at the time. Uh, the company who did this was not violating any laws at the time. Certainly they would be in violation today. But back in the 1950s, we just didn't know. And so the people who fished the local uh, shorelines for fish and shellfish, and that was their primary source of protein in their diet, unknowingly incurred a very massive um, exposure to methylmercury, thousands of people died and had incurred very, uh, un very unfortunate amounts of exposure that led to uh, mental retardation or death. Um, that kind of exposure is extremely rare, uh, has only happened a couple times in known history. And, um, but it was the awakening that caused us to be aware that in fact, mercury was a very dangerous element and we needed to do something about it. So this happened in the latter half of the 1950s. And, and by 1961, in fact, uh, the United oh, by 1971, sorry, the United States, in fact, added mercury to the Clean Water and Clean Air Acts that now protect the environment from mercury uh, to a significant degree. Um, and so we learned from these events and, and, and in this case, we learned that mercury was toxic and, and have since then now tried to move forward with understanding uh, the more general case that we see today. And that's shown on side. So very, very fortunately today, we don't have the Minamata type exposure levels to humans or in wildlife, but that doesn't mean we don't have concerns. Um, the mercury contamination and exposure that happens today is significantly reduced in the amount compared to Minamata, but is nonetheless worrisome. Um, and I think an important note about this is that while humans uh, eat fish in our diet, compared to an animal like a loon, which only eats fish, and there's a lot of animals out in the wild that only eat fish. And because you have a uh, an animal like loons that have evolved to survive by only eat fish and they only feed fish to their young, like in this picture, they in fact uh, ingest far more uh, fish and therefore mercury because 
that's the dominant way that either humans or wildlife get exposed to mercury today. And that is by eating fish that have accumulated mercury from the waters that they're swimming in. But if you can see in the lower right hand corner, the relative rate of exposure of even a 95 percentile human, and that means they're exposed to more mercury than 95% of the human population, they would be getting about 110 grams per, per day per individual. Whereas alone would be getting 90, 906, I'm sorry, that's per year per individual. Whereas alone is getting 960, so more than nine times more mercury exposure simply because they don't have a dietary option. That's the only food that they know how to capture and eat. So that's our concern today. It's, a, it's concerns for humans, and concerns for fish and wildlife that are uh, exposed to mercury at levels that um, are, again, far less than the Minamata incident, but nonetheless can present a level of toxic exposure in some settings. Well, how does this all happen? Um, it took a couple decades to resolve a lot of what goes on in this cartoon type figure. But what, what we've learned over the last two to three decades is that really the sources that have, in fact, most of the areas of, of the earth uh, are atmospheric emissions. And they happen largely from electric power generation from burning coal, but then also from other industrial uses that emit mercury to the atmosphere. Once in the atmosphere, mercury can transport long distances, but eventually it falls to Earth, uh, largely associated with rainfall or snowfall. If that mercury falls onto a system, and it's mostly aquatic ecosystems, and by aquatic ecosystems, we mean lakes and streams and reservoirs and those that have a water a wetted water surface. Those are primarily the locations where the, uh, lo the cartoon in the bottom left-hand corner of this diagram happens. And a couple times today, I've already mentioned the word methyl mercury. Methyl mercury is that very uh, toxic form of mercury. Only a small fraction of the mercury that gets into sediments actually does get methylated. In most sediments, it's only a couple percent. The reaction that happens in sediments is mediated by naturally occurring microbes. They accidentally methylate mercury. They're not trying to methylate mercury, but they conduct their metabolic processes in such a way that they accidentally pick up mercury and also then accidentally methylate it. Um, the methyl mercury in that red kind of exploding area to the lower right is the form that bioaccumulates in the food web. So whereas there's no methyl mercury in the air that deposits mercury from to the earth surface, only a couple percent of mercury in the sediments, by the time you get to that top predator fish like walleye or pike or bass or the in the oceans, the kinds of fish that we generally prefer to eat, all of the mercury that's in that position then in the food web is methylmercury. And that's because methylmercury bioaccumulates very strongly and very efficiently. The inorganic mercury, like the form that I held in my hand when I was a hit kid, does not bioaccumulate nearly as well and can't get to areas in our body, specifically our brain, unless it's methylated. And again, that's an accident of our body. It's accidentally letting methylmercury into our brains because it thinks it's some another compound, not methylmercury. And so we end up with our brains largely serving as a methylmercury trap. So all the methylmercury that we know of that gets into our brain, we have for life. There's no way to get it out of our brain. And so that's why it becomes a lifelong problem, not necessarily from a single event, but from years and years of continued exposure. So that's why we worry about mercury exposure. Well, how does mercury compare to some of the other well-known contaminants on this slide, like PCBs and dioxins and, and chloridane and DDT and all the others? You can see that the number of advisories, 
in terms of river miles in the United States where there are mercury concerns compared to all these other contaminants greatly increased from we first started looking at this in the early 1990s and until recent times. It just continues to build and build compared to these other contaminants that are well known. Mercury contamination far out distances those. Uh, dioxins, in fact, is, is usually only a concern of a very local concern. It, it doesn't really affect widespread areas, and that's why the number 2,000 would be all the way down here. So while dioxin can be a very major concern locally, it's generally not a global concern. But mercury, in fact, is. And this same distribution of concern happens all over the Earth. Mercury is a concern everywhere. Generally, these man-made chemicals shown here are only of concern in areas where they were used. Okay, oh, there we go. So, um, and how do we see that manifested today? I apologize, I thought those um, <laughs> blue lines would go away. Mercury gets in the front of newspapers all the time. Uh, I've been watching this now for nearly 30 years, and this happens to be a, just a, a, a newspaper that I picked up a, a number of years ago in 2002 at my hotel room, and sure enough, the, the problem I study was there on the front page of USA Today. Um, so it gets a lot of publicity. And why does it get a lot of publicity? And again, it gets back to how widespread this problem is. And we won't spend much time on this slide because really the bottom line message from this slide is that mercury consumption advisories for contaminated fish are literally everywhere. Every, every one of the states, every one of our territories, and literally all over the world. And it's interesting, and uh, I can tell you more about it later if we have time, um, uh, it's in fact exaggerated in its contamination levels at the most distant locations. It's kind of an odd and insidious uh, reflection of how mercury works in the environment. In fact, at the po two poles of the earth, that's where the contamination of the food web often is the highest. Um, I see a question. I haven't been uh, paying uh, close enough attention here, but I'll deal with it now. There's a question on the board that says, how does mercury regularly get exposed to water and air? Um, if it wasn't clear before when I was mentioning it, uh, it, it mercury gets emitted to the atmosphere largely from uh, man-made uh, emission sources, the production of electricity and other industrial uh, processes, but it must always be remembered that mercury, because it's one of the elements, also has a natural background source to our Earth's atmosphere. And that comes largely from uh, the emissions, largely uh, in, in back in historical times, from volcanoes and from emissions from the oceans. So those are the two natural sources that we see. Um, so bioaccumulation, how does that happen? In fact, mercury concentrations in water are extraordinarily low. So the y-axis on this figure is uh, in parts per million. So all those zeros down here and then a one. So it's parts per quadrillion that are actually in water. Very, very, very low concentrations. In fact, they're hard to sample and hard to measure. But because of the phenomenally strong bio concentration, that's the first step from water into the first part of the food chain, that's into algae that are produced in lakes and streams and oceans. There's about a million fold increase in mercury in that first step from water into that part of the food chain, and then a more slow and gradual increase to the top level of a food, food web um, here as shown you know, in this part of the diagram. And so by the time you get to the top predator level of a food shed, very commonly we get up to an, uh, a 0.3 parts per million, which is the US EPA's declared fish consumption advisory level. So it's very, very low concentrations in the water. So it, in other words, it doesn't take much at all to get to a problematic level in fish. And that's why this problem can manifest itself almost anywhere on Earth. Just very small amounts from the atmosphere can lead to a problem in local fish. But not all fish are equal. 
and that's very some very important to remember. And that is among fish species, the higher, you know, the higher you go on the food chain. So the time you get to these top level kinds of fish, shark and pike and tuna and halibut, those are the very problematic ones. Um, the lower food web organisms, more or less kind of kinds of, of fish like the tuna in the can, not the top level predatory tuna that we typically would see, as well as some of these other lower food web organisms and fish tend to be much lower and so and are of less concern. Um, this gentleman here who happens to be a friend of mine was very proud of his walleye that he caught, but in my part of the world in Wisconsin, that's that prized fish that a lot of fishermen go for, but it's all my part of the world in Wisconsin, that's that prized fish that a lot of fishermen go for, but it's also at the very top of the food chain. So it too was probably most often in this condition. So um, it really does matter what kind of fish you eat. And that's the, that's the main thing to get a pro, uh, across with, with fish advisories is that you realize that a, not all the fish have the same amount of, of mercury. So uh, this figure isn't drawn to scale. So as many of you know, a herring is just a very small little fish in the ocean. Um, but some of these other fish that are you know, low on the food chain actually have low mercury and are very safe to eat. By the time to get to some of these kinds of fish, the tunas, the like in, uh, carp or panfish, uh, trout, um, those kinds of fish are kind of moderate. Um, so the amount that you recommended to eat for each one of these classes of fish are shown here, here, and here. Um, and it's only when you get to the more lesser numbers of fish, but the ones that exist way at the top of the food chain, and that these are both freshwater and saltwater uh, fish, these are the ones that are, are problematic in terms of you wouldn't want to eat too much of this or too regularly. So these are like swordfish and and shark and mackerel. Those are the problematic types of fish. Okay, so again, our big concern is emissions to the atmosphere, starting here, making its way down through the environment into the sediments, cycling here, making methyl mercury here, and then ending up with entirely methyl mercury. I'm sorry, blue on blue doesn't show up very well. Um, at the top of the food chain. That's our concern. Well, we're, how does uh, the amount of mercury depositing across the United States vary? Well, it varies a lot. So on this slide, areas that are red get more mercury de depositing to the surface of the earth, and areas that are green get less. Well, what controls that? Well, it's two primary factors. The first thing is just simply how much rainfall there is. If you get more rainfall, you will strip more mercury from the atmosphere and bring it down to Earth. So all of these areas down in this part of the world get a lot of rainfall. We know that. But what about some of these areas out here? In fact, some of these are some of the highest rainfall areas in the United States. And so it's not necessarily that they're near a source of mercury emitting to the sky, but it can be just the amount of rainfall. But it is also true that it matters where the emission sources are. And those are the dots on the diagram here. The black dots are all coal burning electric utilities. All the other colored dots are some other industrial emitter, whether it's gold production or a chloralkali plant or some other uh, industrial activity that's emitting mercury. So as you can see, there is some co-alignment of high mercury in where uh, more deposition is happening, is aligned with more that's getting emitted. But in general, uh, there's whole vast areas of the country where we don't see very good correlation at all, like out here in the central mountain states. There's good clustering of coal, coal use out here, but we don't see high deposition. And that's simply because there's not a lot of rainfall or snowfall in that part of the world to bring the mercury that's being emitted back down to Earth. So it's a complicated process. Um, well, what do we see across the world? That's what this map shows. Um, often the United States is implicated as being, you know, the, 
bad actor in a lot of environmental issues. But in fact, compared to the rest of the world, you know, we're kind of middle of the road. We have some higher emitting areas, but certainly compared to Asia and India here, we are, we pale in comparison. And in fact, about 65% of all the world's mercury emissions occur in the combined China and India region. And it's largely because of the very rapid and, and uncontrolled use of mercury in coal and other industries that they're using. So, um, but just because they emit it over there doesn't mean it doesn't become a problem more globally because mercury, again, emitted in China and India can transport all around the world and affect other parts of our, our atmosphere globally. All right, so how, what are the other sources of mercury in, uh, across the globe? I've mentioned coal uses a lot already today. That is a big one. Uh, these are all those other industry sources of mercury that get emitted. But a really important one these days that's happening in a lot of developing countries is called ASGM. And ASGM stands for Artisanal Scale Small Gold Mining. And that dates again, way, all the way back to the Romans, using the same process, the same technology of using liquid elemental mercury to extract gold flakes from gold bearing ore. But because the price of gold has jumped up so suddenly in the last 15 or 20 years, a lot of developing countries and unfortunate individuals that don't know what they're exposing themselves to are back at it again. And that becomes a, now the biggest use of mercury uh, and uh, predicted emissions to the world uh, presently. Well, how does that compare to the United States? You'll see that this big orange block of uh, artisanal scale gold mining use doesn't exist. This is the US's portfolio. And although I, 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 I apparently lost the key for this, we have no uh, artisanal gold mining any longer in the United States. So by comparison, our big piece of mercury that is left for us to uh, work on reducing emissions from is coal burning, and that's this big brown area. But um, for the rest of the world, the biggest piece is artisanal gold mining. And this is some pictures of how that all is done. The miners will go out in the morning and collect mercury from their sluice box. They'll bring it into their, their retort, or this is where they heat their, 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 what's left in the bottom of their, their pan at the end of the day here. They put it over a very hot pan, and all the mercury volatilizes away. So everybody, like this individual here, is breathing that mercury in unknowingly. But there's a lot of people working to try and get, get that solved. So what can we do currently to make our conditions better? Well, we're doing a great job. And that's what I hope uh, the last few slides of my talk you'll go away with is that the, the United States and the, and the world actually are doing a great job at making things better. And for generations to come, we hope that they'll uh, uh, incur an earth where the, the fish and uh, exposure through other ways is not nearly as bad as it has once been. Uh, in the United States, about five years ago, uh, we passed a series of rules that limited mercury emissions from five um, important sources of mercury that are here, uh, or processes, making cement, industrial boilers, that's just industrial uses of coal to produce heat or energy, uh, the gold production rule, the sewage sludge rule, and the commercial industrial waste rules. That eliminated a lot of the mercury that we were putting into our skies. But the big one down here, the regulation of EGUs, that's right here, and I apologize, my, uh, my, my marker is the same color as the background, uh, but EGUs are electric generating units, and that was the big part in the United States we had left to deal with. Well, this new MATS rule, as it's called, the Mercury and Air Toxic Standards Rule, was required 90% reduction of, of mercury emissions. And we're making great progress on that. And we can already see that in our 
in our um, skies and our waters. So again, the Mercury rule was, a, was addressing this big part here. The other parts of, of the previous slide that showed those other regulations were dealing from, with these other parts that are shown here in this key. And, and, and the good news is we are really starting to see change. So compared to about the that time era when I got into mercury research, you know, about 25 and 30 years ago, when there was a lot more mercury being emitted to our skies from coal use, waste incineration, and other uses, all of those three categories are pronouncedly coming down, down, down. And by 2016, we've done a great job, and it's a real victory for the environment in reducing exposures of mercury to fish, wildlife, and humans through controlling our emissions. And so this is a really great story uh, that, you know, and, and, and you all should know that uh, the United States is actually way out in front of, of the world in, in getting this done and, and being a, a country to demonstrate that we, we have other ways to do uh, a lot of the processes that uh, formerly emitted mercury to the environment, and we can still do those processes, but in, in ways that don't pollute our, our environment so much. Um, what we're seeing now, although, although those slopes may look like very gentle, you know, from 1995 to presently, and this is the concentration in rain in these different parts around the United States, we're seeing the slow migration down by eliminating mercury from our airways and our waterways. And th this is the kind of response that it takes. It doesn't happen overnight. And that's why it takes dedicated, careful monitoring of the environment to demonstrate the improvements that we're making. So again, those reductions in emissions that were on the previous slide are now resulting in reductions in rain. And likewise, we're seeing reductions in other parts of the environment. And that's what this slide shows. Um, but Mother Nature always throws us curveballs. And I want to return to my statement from a little, a few minutes ago when I mentioned that how much mercury is falling out of the sky in any particular part of the earth. I, I used the slide of the map of the United States to show where it's red and where it's green a few slides ago. But remember, about 50% of that trend of where it's red versus green in terms of the amount of mercury coming down is due to how much rainfall or snowfall you get in any particular region. Doesn't necessarily get controlled entirely by whether or not you're near an emission source. Well, there's other factors in the environment that also matter a lot. Scientists study these other facts, things like the amount of sulfate and H plus, okay? That's, that's uh, scientists speak for pH. So the lower the pH of your water, the more methyl mercury will generally see produced. And the reason sulfate, that's a constituent in water, uh, the more of that we generally see, the, the, the more uh, strongly the problem is generally manifested. And that's because the specific microbes that unintentionally methylate mercury need this. So if you have more, and this isn't a contaminant, this is a lot of times just naturally occurring, the more sulfate you have around, the more those microbes will convert the the, the, the less damaging part of mercury that falls from the sky into methyl mercury. So the bottom line is it's going to be a bumpy road to recovery uh, because there's going to be areas where, in fact, we're seeing increases in methyl mercury concentration in fish, even though uh, the overall loading of mercury from the sky is going down. And that's because some of these other factors over here can be changing to conspire the, the amount we see in fish. But overall, with time, we fully expect that all of these arrows are going to be eventually pointing down uh, as we eliminate more and more mercury sources throughout the United States and the world. And that's the last part of my, of my slides, and I'll, I'll finish up real quickly. There's this very... Um, important thing going on across the world. It's called the Minamata Convention on Mercury. It's led by the United Nations Environmental Program. 
The United States is playing a very significant leadership role in pushing this forward and getting the news out and encouraging countries across the world to join on. Currently, 147 countries have signed on to this treaty. The treaty seeks to eliminate 75% of the current global emission of mercury to the world's atmosphere. It's named after the very famous and unfortunate incident in Japan called Minamata, where that very sad story happened in the 1950s. Um, as I said, there's been a, as of uh, 2013, 147 countries have signed on globally. Uh, once 50 nations have ratified that treaty uh, nationally within their countries, then it will go into force 90 days after that. I think. 25 or so countries have ratified it, while 147 have signed on, then the politics of the individual country have to happen where each country agrees through their, you know, equivalent of our Congress to agree to ratify that and buy into, yes, we will, we will, we sign on and we will achieve that. Um, but we're fully expecting that by about 2020, uh, that a significant number of countries across the world will be in, in compliance with the Minamata Treaty and we'll see very uh, significant reductions of mercury. Uh, we're already seeing it and, and that's great news. On this map, any area that's blue and that's most of this diagram is already seeing declining trends. And this is the percent per year that we're seeing in the atmosphere at any one of the locations on Earth. Um, and the only spots where we're continuing to see increases are these areas over here in Asia, India, and Indonesia, where mercury uses are still increasing. But we're working internationally through the Minamata Treaty to decrease uh, those uses over in Asia. And once we get uh, some of those areas in compliance with Minamata, we fully expect that we will see uh, decreasing trends like we see here currently in Europe and in North America. It's very interesting that when you go to high latitudes over here, these are areas at the poles of the Earth, the North and South Pole. And it's these areas where we see very little change. And it makes perfect sense when we stand back and really think about it. These are the areas of the Earth that aren't near any emission sources. So as we start to control the amount of mercury that are away from those sources, Unfortunately, these areas uh, aren't going to see as much uh, significant improvement uh, because they're not, in fact, uh, affected by being close to those emission sources. Um, but if we can knock out, you know, mercury emissions at, at uh, all around the Earth, you know, in about the 2020 time frame, we fully expect areas like the, the poles to go down, 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 that they'll be in this area. Uh, maybe by about 2020, 2025. Um, so in summary, mercury contamination of the environment, I believe is a great example of how with persistence good science, we can use scientific information to inform environmental management and lead to improve conditions, but patience is really needed. None of these problems are solved overnight. Uh, I had to learn that tough lesson back when I was in my 20s when I first started looking at this problem. Uh, but it takes time uh, to, to uh, convince the world on, on a number of these issues. Um, our awareness has really improved about the processes, the sources, and uh, in the 60 years since Minamata, we don't have these incidents going on any longer. So that's great. Uh, mercury exposure to humans is important. But we have to also be aware that the real message from fish advisories is in fact that fish, I eat fish, I try to eat fish as often as I can, is part of a, a healthy diet. But just be aware of what kind of fish you're eating. I certainly pay attention to the menu when I'm ordering the fish on the menu and their relative mercury levels. And so you know how much fish is safe to eat. And lastly, environmental science, and this is the part I want, I want to hopefully get someone or several of you excited about environmental science today who are online is a rewarding career path and we need more young people to be excited about career pathways in environmental science and that you'll uh, carry this torch forward as we carry on. So I see I've had a couple more questions pop out. Um, I'm going to um, read these and hopefully we have time for 
a few other remaining questions. Uh, the one, first one I haven't addressed are, are there other examples of where a community was affected by Minam, like Minamata was? Yes, there are. Um, almost invariably, they happened in developing countries where it wasn't a, an intentional poisoning at all, but uh, an unfortunate um, uh, accident. Uh, probably other than Minamata, the most famous incident that happened uh, in Earth history was uh, after the Minamata incident, and it happened in uh, Iraq. And in that case, um, the United Nations, I believe it was the United Nations anyway, was delivering uh, seed, I believe it was wheat seed, to Iraq so they could use it to plant uh, and grow wheat for their own purposes. And they had coated the seeds with mercury to prevent spoiling of the seeds, because mercury is a very a uh, very potent and effective way to prevent spoiling because it kills most microbes. So they had printed in English on the bags of seed, uh, do not eat, preserved with mercury, dangerous, all that. But unfortunately, the villagers who were given those seeds did not read English. And some of them took the easy way out and instead of planting those wheat seeds, in fact, ground them into flour and ingested the mercury. And it was a very, very uh, unfortunate uh, incident, very much similar in scale to uh, what happened in Minamata. Um, let's see here. Uh, what were some of the actions the community in Minamata took to fix the contamination? Uh, well, time. Uh, inform the people inform the people that uh, eating the fish from their local bays were dangerous. Uh, to this day, however, uh, mercury contamination in the nearby shoreline areas around Minabata are still much, much higher than other areas, you know, uh, 150 miles away or so. Um, and so awareness is the biggest key to making sure that people don't continue to get um, uh, exposed to very high levels of mercury. Uh, but as I mentioned earlier in my talk, because mercury is an element, time will not degrade the, uh, the condition very, uh, or improve the condition very um, rapidly. Um, through years of accumulation of cleaner sediment, you will, you will dilute the mercury in that sediment and eventually yield cleaner fish. And hopefully with time, but unfortunately it's probably going to take a lot of time before those areas are clean enough to eat the fish in that area. Um, looking at some of the other questions here. Um, oh, let's see here. Um, oh, I went the wrong way. Um, what colleges should we look to study environmental science? Um, well, first of all, I'm, I'm going to make a recommendation. If you're interested in environmental science, um, first of all, go go to the best college that you can find that is a good fit for you. There's, you know, there's fit, you know, matters in terms of size of the college, the kind of college it is. So it's not necessarily a big college. I went to big colleges, but that was a good fit for me. Many, many uh, different kinds of colleges and universities have very good environmental science programs. Um, I think uh, those programs are, are uh, easy to find on the internet by doing some quick Google searches. Uh, some small colleges emphasize environmental programs and produce very, very uh, well-educated uh, people with bachelor's degrees. And then generally the bigger universities are where people end up going to pursue you know, graduate degrees in environmental science. Uh, but I, I, the answer is certainly uh, a very long list. I mean, everywhere I go, I, I encounter great uh, small colleges, great big universities uh, that have really nice environmental programs. And uh, what I would say is if you have specific questions along those lines, my contact information was on the first slide, or you can just Google Kravenhoff and Mercury. I'll bet I'm the first Google person you find with Kravenhoff on Mercury. So um, that's, that's what I would encourage you to do. And so I can see I'm at the end of my time. 
I thank you for attending my seminar. I encourage you to follow me up with uh, email or telephone calls, and I would be glad to talk to anybody along those lines. Thank you, everyone.